All right. Well, and I did turn the recording back on. Yay. So, um, so this evening, our guest is, uh, is Kiko Gavantes, uh, who's a painter and who's had a very interesting life in the arts. And so we're going to, uh, I've been given some questions because we just met uh, moments ago. Yeah. Um, so uh, in order that I know what to ask, uh, Todd, who does know uh, Kiko for a while, has given me some things to, to ask you. Um, so you were born in Havana uh, and your yeah. family were evidently major architects in pre-revolutionary uh, Cuba. So, and also it says here, your grandfather was also an art collector, which you are as well. Yes, so, uh, granddad collected uh, colonial paintings, particularly Cuban. And mm -hmm. at one point he had the largest collection of colonial paintings in the world, um, which Mr. Castro, Fidel Castro, helped himself to. And every once in a while we see him pop up at, at auction and it's a little bit distressing, but yeah, uh, granddad was a pretty major art collector and architect. He built the national capital, the main library, the Biblioteca Jose Marti, which is the first international style building in Latin America. And that was finished in 1960, I believe. And, um, a lot of the civic buildings is what he wound up doing, hospitals, libraries, as well as private homes like Catalina Lassa, the sugar barons, all that sugar money. They built some pretty extravagant palaces. Well, I would think that coming from that family would have had a lot of influence on your direction in life. So is that so? I mean, how did that influence you? Well, uh, the influence of wasn't so much growing up, it was afterwards. Growing up was pretty tough because we were an immigrant. So like any immigrant family, or like many immigrant families, we came here with nothing, a couple suitcases and some paintings, luckily were stashed into the suitcases. So we were able to get some paintings out, but, um, Growing up was growing up in projects until both my parents worked. So my dad is an architect and my mom was at the Inter-American Development Bank. And little by little, with the help of the US government, we were able to buy a house and you know, live the American dream. So it's kind of weird to come from a, a, a well-known family, fairly well-to-do, and to a country where nobody knows you. I'm the only kid with brown skin in a white, environment. It was, the, the 60s in America were very different than what it's like today, obviously. So uh, growing up with a Latin name was uh, extremely challenging. Um, mm -hmm. And coming to a world where you didn't, you didn't know what the food was or the language or anything. So that, that influenced me a lot more in the moment than the memories of what we left behind. And so you've chosen painting as your primary mm. mode of expression. Um, so, so what's your approach to creating something new? What, how do you start that process? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I think like anything, any of the arts, making music, uh, writing, you just have to jump, you, you go, and you trust that there'll be a net to catch you. And the net is the ability to somehow have communication or a dialogue with the process that you're engaged in. So if I'm doing a watercolor that I turn off the part of me that's that's the sort of uh, critic that is wants perfection or whatever, and just go, just start. And I that's how I do work though. Um, people work very very differently. And the series I just finished, the COVID series, that where I'm illustrating what 
what I think the virus looks like is total stream of consciousness. So sometimes it can be, the approach can be stream of consciousness. So, you know, blank piece of paper and go jump off the diving board. Other times it can be running with an idea, conceptual work. Um, like how do I, there was one project that I've been working on for years and years. And that is, um, I buy the signs that people hold at the side of the road, well, before COVID that, and I, you know, I'll give them five bucks to buy their sign. And eventually I'd, I'd like to have an exhibition where all of the signs are on the floor and that's it, blank walls. So that in theory, we're walking on top of these people and we, we really do every day walk on top of people. So, so or on top of them. And so that there's many different ways, the, the two that I've illustrated are stream of consciousness and then taking an idea and figuring out how, how can I flesh this out? How can, I, how can I bring to light the plight of people that are underprivileged and that, that are homeless? How do, how, do I, how do I shine a light on that? So my approach was, well, let me show the world what they made, what their sign is. One of my favorite ones, or one of the most poignant ones is, oh man, I'll never forget buying that one, was a guy holding up a sign that says, how would you like to be me? And I just thought, wow. Uh, and that was, that was really something. And since you're always at the highway, you know, where you're going onto the freeway or coming off, you can't really have a conversation, but that's one of the things that interests me is social inequity and uh, uh, so issues like that I, I would I would deal with directly. But what 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 I love doing more than anything is just uh, hardcore stream of consciousness. You, you don't allow yourself to think at all. Use use and get to know what that part of your brain is that doesn't have an idea ahead of time. It just, you, you have a blank piece of paper and you just go, you start. I hope that helps. The, uh, well, it the does. next question that Todd had suggested, which I think really comes right from that, which is that you mm -hmm. used a number of different painting techniques in your career. And so what has you choose a particular technique over another? I mean, we've seen the two sort of basic threads of you know, representing an idea and then uh, simply letting your consciousness uh, produce images. Um, and so what then leads you to a particular technique? I guess it's mostly going to be on the second side where you're just letting the, the images come through you as it were. Um, I don't know, what, uh, what would pick, what, what kind of media, you know, how do you make a decision about what's what you're going to have be expressed that way. Well, that's that's the other place that is very important is uh, how, how do I want to get this idea across? Is it going to be using oil and canvas? Is it watercolor? Is it, uh, I don't do that much sculpture, but I, I have with ready-mades, with things that I find and I kind of reassemble them. But, um, it, the easiest way I can describe how, how I draw is, or how I approach artwork is, and picture yourself at a club and then put on some music. If you start thinking about where am I gonna move, where am I gonna put my foot, my arm, my, it's like, oh my gosh, no, just dance. Just start, go with it. So it, it's, I, th that's my approach is, is, is let me start and then have enough stuff around me in my studio that there's watercolors, there's the oils are there, the equipment is there. Just have everything at hand so that if, if I find that mm, this isn't really working very well with water and paper, let me see how it, how it feels with canvas and I, I, I can switch around. But having access to materials in front of you is, is the important thing. And sometimes that's, that is the way to start, is not to select a topic or, or a subject, but to select what I do is I select the paper and the colors, and then that's pretty much it. So that's another <coughs> of, uh, 
Well, bless you. I'm um, just yourself. Yeah. <coughs> Todd has some images of work of your work, and um, I think you know, having heard some description of your process, now's the time to look. Oh, okay. Yeah. Todd, you need the other. It's <coughs> the other screen again. The the one, I don't know which photo you all are seeing, the one of me sitting in front of, that's Govantes y Gavarrocas. Hold on. Hold on. He's going to switch back. Oh, okay. <coughs> there you go. You got it. Okay. Uh, that's me about 20 years ago in front of the library, the Biblioteca Jose Martí in Havana. Um, one of one of my granddad's buildings. So, and the next shot, what was it, Todd? Uh, oh, that's that's the house. That's where I was born. Um, my bedroom is at the top left in the front there. But it's now, as you can see <laughs> from the flag, it's the the British Embassy. My grandparents were held under house arrest here from nineteen. 60 through 1978, 78 or 79, I forget. Um, Castro had them under house arrest. My grandfather and therefore my family was in a kind of an odd situation in that my granddad was a real patriot in the sense of he loved his country and he, he loved the whole culture of, of the Cuban people. So he would take a salary of, I think my dad told me once it was like a dollar a year. You had to get paid. So he would take the minimum amount. But people liked him. I mean, the common person in the street liked, liked him. That presented a problem for Castro because the, the sort of, uh, the deal was that all the rich people have you've got to get rid of them. They don't, they do nothing for us, blah, blah, blah. So that, that was, that, that was problematic. So the way they addressed it, the Cuban government, is they just locked them up in their house. And um, I, I found it a little bit cruel, but that's, that's how they dealt with it. And then finally under Jimmy Carter, my father was able to reach the Carter somehow and through the State Department, we flew down to Mexico and my grandparents left Cuba. My dad, or my granddad was 92 at that point. I think he thought that this would all be over soon. And that's the way that most Cubans have spent their life is this will all be over next week. You know, first it was next week, then it was next month, then it was next year, then it was. And I think that's the story of any diaspora is you, you, you want to go back, you look forward to going back, and then you find that you're no longer of that culture. You're coming to America does do something to cultures. That's what I find so very interesting about this country uh, is that we are able to do things uh, here and find out parts of who we are that it, it's just not available in other countries. Uh, an interview like this would be forbidden in Cuba. There's no way that this could be. Um, so I forget what your question was, though. Sorry. Well, I have a suggestion that we just go through some of the works you shared. We've got quite a few images on this oh, uh, sure. slide deck. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Do you do that or do I? Do? Oh, you do. That. Oh, uh, yeah, you can just go over that. That was just a reminder for me. Well, the cup, the idea of the cup, let me just, can you see the this here is so, okay. So, the idea of the cup is I first started working with cups in grids so that they're, they're, you know, just picture a grid and then a lot of the cups. The idea of the cup is I kept asking myself, well, this, this, this would be a good way of explaining how do I come up with an idea and then develop it. I kept asking myself, what is the source of civilization? What, what was the first idea that man had to have in order to have freedom from the river? And I realized it was making a cup. When you form a cup, you can transport water. Water is the only thing that we need to have pretty much every day. It's the only thing that we cannot live without the longest. So once the ability to transport water is there, you can leave 
the river, your, your addiction, so to speak, to the river is, is gone and that allows you to travel. That always fascinated me because today all we do is turn this faucet and, and this magic comes out, uh, water. And some parts of the world where I've lived and traveled like Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, you, you've got to really hustle to get water. Uh, there's, there's no simple way. And yet in this country, it's something that is, is in this world, it's something that we take for granted in, in the Western part of the world. Um, so the, the cup became a, a way of playing around with that idea. And then if I added a head, I don't know if you all can see that, a head to the cup and then appendages, um, you have a figure. So then with having the figure, then I could tell stories with it, make narratives, create people, situations. And like one show I did was called The Adventures of Ansel and Gertrude. I made up a couple, Ansel and Gertrude, and took them on vacation to different places around the world. So that was uh, about 25 or 30 paintings. that were it was just kind of fantasy fun, fun paintings. Um, but very much in that style of, of the stick figure, the, the cup and, and so on. Todd, can we go to the last one? The, uh, oh, oh, wait a minute. Um, in this one also, this was, this painting is very difficult for me. It was the one that was from a show called The City of Men. And it was the one called The City of Men in Turmoil. It was done right after the AIDS epidemic started, so, or the AIDS pandemic. Um, if you look carefully at the figures, none of them touch except one couple in the center towards the right <coughs> at the edge. Yeah, there it is. And that those are the only people that are, that are touching. And I, I felt like the partner I had at the time, Bill was trying to protect me. I was 23 or 24 at that time. Um, from this disease that nobody knew what it was. At the time, it was horrible because it was even worse in this pandemic because we did not know how is this thing being spread. You didn't know if it was shaking somebody's hand, if it was, you just had no idea. So I mean, you can imagine a city where there's that many um, target audience living, like you know, the gay population, it's, it, it was very frightening. And I wanted to, to show that, and that's what this painting was about. Um, and then little by little, the figures, you know, you tell enough stories and then it gets to be, okay, what's, what's next? And I, I realized that they, these figures can also be coat hangers. I use them like coat hangers to hang ideas of colors, of forms, um, and, and to add depth to the painting so that <laughs> you can actually pick them up and they, they weigh quite a bit because the, the paint is heavy. And uh, the white painting, Todd, would, would be an example of the, well, this is, a, this is an example too. Um, here you can see the, the figures are still there, but little by little, they, they disappear. They get painted out. They, they get moved around, shifted, and then they disappear. This is all, this one, they disappear. It sounds like uh, <laughs> what Trump said about the virus, but no, in, in this case, they, the figures kind of pop in and out um, depending on what colors you're looking at. I think every color has a different speed. Like red is something that hits the retina very fast. Yellow is a fast color. Blue is a color that recedes. So you play around with the speed, almost like music, of, of what, you, what you want to express. In this case, I was doing a series uh, called Four Seasons. There is four paintings this size, each of them 36 inches by 36 inches. This is winter. The cutouts, you can't really see, but there's um, collage in here, the part of these all over, the cutouts were from the New York Times, the Sunday section, because that's pretty much what you do all winter, <laughs> sit inside and read. 
Um, and the, the, in, in any painting, whether it's mine or somebody else's, the thing I look for is the artist's job, my job is to keep you entertained, to keep the eye entertained. So every painting, like this blue painting, the winter one we're looking at now, every painting has a point of entry. Something, there's a place that your eye hits first. It, it, it just has to by definition, because you can't take in the whole thing at, at once. Um, so that's the window that kind of takes you into the painting. And then my job is just to keep your eye bouncing around, going from one place to the other, to the other, to the other, until you're ready to walk away. So with all of these, it's just balancing the colors. Um, all, of, all of the series of stuff that we're looking at now um, are, are very dense and very layered. So they, they took about two seasons each, so two years. So in the spring, I would, this, is, this one is summer. So I started it one summer, put it away when the fall started and, and worked on the fall, <laughs> put that away until winter and, and so on. Um, anyway, did that answer the question? I hope someone. <laughs> it gives us some insight into how oh, we get. Oh, this is the, um, the one that I, I wanted to refer to, this is what I was looking for and kind of going towards. If you look at the very first stick figure painting that's very raw, is there a way to go back, Todd, to, to pictures, to go back to the first yep. one? Right. <laughs> okay, if, if you see that it's it's very raw, there's the background, which is a very, very deep olive green, and the flesh tone. Um, that's it, there's two colors. If you go to look at the, the white painting, it's still using the stick figures, or any of these other paintings. The stick figure here that is the central one is absolutely in the center, which is the, the red figure. This painting is about what it's like to, what, the, what I feel it's like to live in a city. You're surrounded by people, there's, there's visual noise constantly, there's always things going on around you, and yet you're alone. So there's a sense of loneliness in a city that, I, I feel much lonelier in a city than I do in the woods, in the middle of the woods, oddly. So that red figure in the center, uh, the stick figure represents sort of symbolically what, what, what that is like um, to feel. So before kind of we, the next sequence of images is actually um, uh, <laughs> something you're working on recently. Um, Joe, I'm wondering if you, you want to ask a couple more questions. Well, actually, I would, the, uh, one piece of housekeeping as well which is that if any of the people who are attending uh, in our webinar have questions or things they'd like to ask of Kiko, please uh, use the chat to do that, and uh, Todd will pick them up at the end, or so we can, uh, we can do that. Um, I guess the thing that I was, uh, well, there's a couple of things. One is you've done now a lot of gallery shows in various parts of the country, but um, what was your first one? What was that first professional uh, show that? The very first one was called uh, The City of Men. That was in 1982 or 83 in San Francisco. And that was where I introduced those uh, stick figures. That was uh, 20 paintings. It, it, as, as I look back on it, 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 was, it was a lot of fun. I, it, it was uh, the... A, a very young San Francisco scene at the time, that was 1981, like I said. And the, the group of folks that I, I knew it, at the time were um, very much, had kind of made it in the arts. I, I don't know how I landed in with these folks, but so it, it, was, it was wonderful to have an opening that was well attended and almost all the paintings sold. I, I kept one, and that's the one that, that we saw at the beginning. That's, that's the only one I have of the 20 paintings. There were, Leonard Bernstein bought some, uh, 
Michael Tilson Thomas had a couple. And anyway, there was, it, it was very, um, it, 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 it was, it was fun to do a show and have it have some degree of success at at that point in time. Yeah. The um, well, actually, <clears throat> Todd wrote a great question here. So I'm mm -hmm. not going to take authorship for it. Um, in a way, you survived well three revolutions: uh, mm -hmm. the revolution in Cuba, uh, mm -hmm. the AIDS pandemic, and now our uh, current uh, battle that we're fighting against uh, microbes. Mm -hmm. um, how have those experiences informed your work? I and mean, you told, told us a little, told us a little about that, but what are you working on now? Um, right now I'm working on this series of pieces, uh, the, the COVID pieces I had mentioned a little bit earlier, where I the first ones were, the first couple, I didn't send Todd pictures of, but there were pieces like this, which is how we were told the virus looks like. So, you know, very much, I don't know, like a virus. And then I thought, well, that's not very interesting. So what, what, what does it look like? I mean, mine is unique to me. So everyone has a unique virus. What does mine look like? So... Oh, change or how do you? Oh, there we go. So that <laughs> that's one of them. This one I I I like a lot. It's very humorous because the virus is walking literally. Um, it looks like two legs, but it the idea of something that's not very attractive, kind of hideous, but holds your eye and isn't warm and fuzzy yet captures your attention is the intention I had with this. And to have fun a little bit in, in during an era where it's it just seems like everything is so different now than than it was twelve months ago. So uh, I just kept imagining. Can you go to the next one? How the virus changes, and every day I would make a painting, and then we can go to the next one. And some days the virus is quieter than other days. This one I, I, I really like because it's, it's just very calm. There's a sense of, of taking a, or a sense of exhale, taking a breath and just chilling for a second. But like any virus, it, 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 it will take a breath and then explode. So all, all of them, you can keep switching back and forth or keep going. All of them, I... I, I, I did want to introduce a little bit of humor to, to catch the viewer and the audience and to, to give them something. Um, fun where there isn't much. Yeah, the, I mean, it's, it, this is definitely the most unique thing that I, that the most unique position I've ever been in in my life where an entire world is feeling the same thing. And if you think about it, I don't think historically we have ever been in a situation like this. And I think we all need to take a deep breath and just uh, do things like this w w through artwork, ex express your fears, express the joy that color can give the eye. Color is really like food. It's, it's something that once you, once you look at it and and especially as, as one is applying it, as, you're, as, you're, as the brush touches the paper, and I, and I call it kissing the paper, but as, as when, that, when they meet and the, the pigment starts flowing in the paper, that's when the mind kind of shuts off and it's more, it becomes more of a meditation. Um, and, and that's how I look at these is they're, they're, they're meditations, they're, they're fun. I do not think about ahead of time, what is it going to look like? I just pick a place and start. <clears throat> so there's no like sketch done or anything like that ahead of time. Is that the, the last one, Todd, or I don't know how many? Yes. That, that was oh. the last one. Okay. okay. Anyway, there's, there's about 25 of those. There'll be, I'm going to exhibit... <clears throat> um, oh, <clears throat> pardon me. About probably about sixteen of them in a grid, uh, 
at a, a place called TSL Time Space Limited in Hudson. What, what I wanted to do was- Hudson, New York. Hudson, New York. Yes. Um, was to associate a quote with every piece. So the name of the piece, the pieces will just be like whatever the piece is, at the date that I made it, like, you know, June 10th, whatever. And then uh, 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 what I did in, in making them is I, I took a very poignant quote, like the one that was, I think it was January 28th, the quote that our president made that said, it's, it's just one guy and he's in Seattle and this is going nowhere. We have nothing to worry about. So each one of the paintings, there's a quote associated with it that um, I, I like to play off words and images because it, it is kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm not happy with the way that it rolled out, how, how awful the federal government was about this. Um, and I do want to bring that to the viewer's attention, but in a kinder way and hopefully kind of get the hook in th with a pretty picture, so to speak, and, um, and have the idea sink in little by little that, my gosh, this is a really unique situation we're in. And I, I wanted to get that, to hold a mirror up to somebody, but not let them know that I'm holding up a mirror. So that hopefully the words and the images will combine. And at some point, there'll be a realization that this is a really unique period that we're living, that we're all living through. Every, yeah, every single person on the planet, I, I can't believe, is, is, has one thing on their mind every single day. And that, there's never been a time like that historically. So I, I, I wanted to, not even wanted to, almost had to address it somehow. And that's, that's what these pieces were. And that's what these pieces are, because I continue to make them. I made some last night. And actually, I was going to show you the, um, this is how they start. Is Here's examples of the, the, the paper is totally soaked. I just put it under the sink, run it in water. And then when the lines go down, you know, it bleeds out. Um, so here's another one. So I just put them on a piece of, of plastic the, or some kind of plexi and, and the wet paper and then start making the lines and then start adding the colors. So, I mean, you can see, and some of the, the whites or, or some of these lines might get painted out because I, I can also cover this with white and, you know, start all over, so to speak which this will allow, this, this technique allows to an extent. If it was oils, I could definitely cover it up and no problem. But um, with these, it's kind of fun because you, you can change them and there is an immediacy. So I, I got to hit all of the, uh, the things that I like to do in, in the process aspect of making the piece of artwork. is uh, I, It's something I enjoy. I, I love seeing the explosion of color and um, and just not knowing what you're going to wind up with. It, it might be terrible. It might be a, a tosser and that's fine because I figure I've got at least a hundred thousand bad paintings in me. So as soon as I get them out, the quicker it will be till I get to the good ones. So. Uh, which kind of lines up with our last question. Uh, you know, um, if you were talking to somebody who's considering uh, a life in the arts. Um, what would you advise them? What's uh, how they, how should they get started, and how should they choose what they want to do? I. It's an interesting question. I've I've thought of that, and I I think that one doesn't really choose painting. It's more like it chooses you. Uh, mm. It. It happened to be, I, I, I went to a liberal arts college, so I, I had the opportunity to, to study anything I wanted pretty much. And boy, I tried everything. I, I tried the biology, I, you know, I tried everything, astronomy. And 
there was just something every day I would go back home and, and be painting. And that's when I realized, my gosh, I'm a painter. That's what I like to do. So why not do it? And then I, I sort of had that at the back of my head when I wanted to go to, to school initially to, to college. And I thought, well, I don't want to go to an art school, even though I, I'm pretty sure I want to be an artist, because I think the more important thing is to learn how to think first. And so that, that's what a liberal arts education gave me was the, the opportunity to study works that help develop the mind. I figured if the mind gets developed, then you'll ask the right questions. By asking the right questions, you'll figure out what to paint. And that's, that's that. So I, I would recommend to someone starting out to just keep working. That's, that's the only way is every single day to, to work. <laughs> and that the, the greatest books out there are, are hanging on walls. And, and you, you just always, always, always look. Go to as many museums as you can, as many homes, and, and just keep looking. Let's see, we have a question here. If, um, uh, have you ever taught or do you have students? No. <laughs> um, I don't think, I, 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 I'm not sure I'd be the, the, the most patient person to, to teach. I, I would love to teach. I mean, I've taught kids and things like, technique is fun. That, that, that's, that I do enjoy. But I've never really, uh, the idea of creating a syllabus or, you know, whatever, coming up with, um, with a formal way of, I, I don't know how to do that because I, I, I never went to an art school, so I, I don't know. And, and I, I, I love to encourage people, so I, I, I think that's the only way I can teach is, is um, through example, but that's, uh, I, I've never had like a 8.30 on Friday, you've got to be in Kiko's class. It's no. <laughs> the only thing I've taught is my dog. <laughs> but not the paint. Well, I'll say that you've taught your friends a lot too, Kiko. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Well, Kiko, it's been really wonderful making your acquaintance. Oh, well, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate y'all's interest in this. And um, uh, I encourage you to, to, if you're in Manhattan, you know, just, just go to the galleries. It's free. And the museums, they are a little pricey. But um, if you join, you can always go and get to know the paintings. Get, and, and, and get to see how it changes. Like one of my favorite paintings, a portrait of Peter Manich, that's in the um, National Gallery of Art. I've stood in front of that painting at least, at least 150, 200 times. And it's different every time. And allow that to happen. Allow yourself to change your mind on something. There's some artists that you might look at and say, this is real junk. Allow it to be that you might change your opinion on that, to keep an open mind. I think is very important. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. This oh, time. it's my pleasure. And, and uh, uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I want to call so out I, a, a few things that, um, so there's a documentary film called Viva El Vedado, a, the story of a neighborhood. And it's um, in that film. Uh, it's actually linked from Masterworks Facebook page. But you also can view it on BD Powers dot org. Um, in that film on, I think it's minute 41 or something, uh, Kiko's grandfather is called out and one of his buildings is featured, a hospital that he created in Havana. Um, Kiko mentioned that he uh, has a gallery show at Time and Space Limited TSL in Hudson. We'll be featuring that on our Facebook page. I know there's another um, show, Kiko, that where some of your collection is being featured in Manhattan. Um, do you want to, do you want to mention that? Sure. Uh, the Andrew Kreps gallery, um, 
K R E P S. That's in it's it's about in Midtown. Um, is having a show of Beatrice Wood's drawings. Uh, Beatrice Wood was an extraordinary artist. I had the luxury of knowing her quite well for about I don't know twelve years or something. We met when she was in her late eighties, and she died at one hundred and five. So. Um, we had some some nice nice years, and I collected her work because I I just love it. That's some of her work behind the the pottery, but anyway, there's there's a lot of drawings that I collected of hers, and they'll be they'll be at this gallery show. And her work you can see any any museum you know the Metropolitan, the Whitney, any museum that uh, has has her work, and I I would recommend going to see. That show, if you can, because like I say, it's a gallery and it's free and it's, they're beautiful pieces. They, they really are something. Okay. So does anybody have any questions? Feel free to, to holler if you do. Well, our, our friend Alice, uh, another thing in the chat, basically saying that she wishes you would teach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank but, you. Uh, you. You can be my first student. <laughs> Okay. I, I I would like I'm not I'm not adverse at all I I, I would love to do it um, I I just don't know if I have the skills quite honestly um, but I, I I do enjoy with children working with them and uh, I'm, I'm I'm happy to volunteer to to do any any kind of teaching if you, if who was it Alice that asked that if it's a yeah. kids class I'll I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing oh, with us this okay. evening, and it's just been a real delight to make your acquaintance. And, thank uh, you very much, Joe. That's we'll uh, awesome. we'll be back next week uh, with uh, Darcy Darlington. Same, uh, back okay. same, same bat channel. Same bat time. Same, same bat channel. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll uh, and uh, you no, know, she's also had an interesting and varied life in the arts. So um, anyway. Thanks very much, and everyone have a great evening. Great. Take Thank care. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.